host Teresa, and today we'll be counting down the top 10 bizarre cults you won't believe exist. In at number 10 is the Brethren, and it's way less cooler than it sounds. Living an almost Amish way of life, this pilgrim esque cult is actually led currently by one of Forbes' richest men alive, who lives in a $5 million mansion while his followers aren't even allowed to travel outside of their communities. They have small sites around the world and follow some extreme expectations, such as men must work at their exclusive businesses, women stay at home. Brethren are not permitted to eat at non-brethren restaurants, stay in hotels, or even live in apartment buildings in a non-member neighborhood. They can't have a swimming pool or use a computer unless it was created and approved for brethren use by a brethren company. The internet is a pipeline to filth, so brethren businesses provide cell phones and computers with a software called WordX that permits only word processing, spreadsheets, accounting programs, and email, but no internet. Women are only to dress from neck to wrist and neck to ankle coverage styles and have a ribbon or scarf in their overtly long hair. Men need to be clean shaven and dress in business casual. Brethren children are to live at home with their parents until the day that they are married. Typically the women get married young because their purpose is to be a dutiful wife and produce lots of children. The brethren genuinely believe that those on the outside of the cult, especially those who left, are evil and living life wrong. Getting kicked out or withdrawn from in this community keeps members in check as losing this lifestyle means being condemned to hell to them. It can be argued between their messiah being a man of God figure that changes from one billionaire to another every so often, and their exclusive, strict, and elitist premises is that these qualities seem to be an antithesis of what religious movements are supposed to be. But I guess that's up to their eccentric billionaire god. In at number 9 is Crazy for Coconuts. It's a little confusing, but here goes. This German nudist dude, August Engelhard, was so devoted to the consumption of coconuts that he started a cult about them. Loving nothing more than chafing sand and a good sunbird, Engelhard loved sunlight and the tropics. So he started a group of like-minded individuals in Papua New Guinea. While the others were a little more normal at first, Engelhart went hard and only consumed coconuts from day one. He was convinced that the sun was the source of all life, and the coconut, because it grew on top of palm trees closer to the sun than any other food, was clearly the best food in the world. He used his big fat inheritance to publish journals about his coconut beliefs in order to develop what he called the Order of the Sun, wherein members would worship the sun with him. It worked, mostly because it was his money that was shipping people out there. Free relocation to the tropics to eat fruit and dance nude under the sun. Come on, even I'd pack up, let's be real. Even at its peak, the cult never hit 100 members because they had a bad habit of, well, not surviving, only eating coconuts. There were no doctors, and this is an island known for venomous animals and potential illnesses that can be hard to treat. Accidents were also an issue as many of these people had no idea how to navigate island living and were also physically weakened from, you guess it, only eating coconuts. Even Engelhart was eventually wasting away from coconut exclusive dieting. He couldn't walk, was severely malnourished, afflicted with ulcers, he weighed under 100 pounds and was having seizures, all thanks to a diet of non-stop coconut and generally poor living conditions. Number 8 is one I struggle not to laugh about. It's the Prince Philip movement. Prince Philip had many titles and honors being a British royal, but did you know in a remote South Pacific colony he was actually believed to be a deity? This is a wild ride, but the Prince Philip movement, a sect followed by the Yehonanan tribe on southern island of Tana and Van Anunnaki believed him to be the pale son of an ancient mountain spirit. The origins of Philip's divine status and why he's assumed to be the spirit's son is unclear. It's believed this mountain spirit's son, though, would travel to a distant land marrying a powerful lady and in time return, which solidified to the people of Tana the belief that Philip was the embodiment of the spirit when he and the queen visited Vananatu in 1974 when he was still unaware of his status as a deity there. The love of Philip was so strong that the British resident commissioner in Vananatu requested the special photographs on behalf of the people, which Philip actually granted. In return, they sent him a pig slaughter club that he posed with at Buckingham Palace for them. He also met privately with a group of five Tana community members that were flown to Britain for a reality show meet and greet. The photographs of Prince Philip remained with the chief, Jack Nevea, who died in 2009 having never saw his dream of the Duke's return to Tana realized. For decades, two villages on the Vananatan island of Tana have revered the Duke of Edinburgh as a godlike spiritual figure. At his passing, the peoples mourned deeply, and BBC reported that a private message to the Queen Elizabeth had even been given to journalists at scene, who conveyed it to the British officials before her passing. This one is kind of wacky in a fun way. Number 7 is Railism. Rail has had a colorful life. Race car driver, cabaret singer, and alien communicator. He called the aliens the Elohim, and the pitch of his cult is that the Elohim are historically mistaken for gods by ancient civilizations and are the explanations for many of the great wonders of the world and historic advancements. He says Elohim had hybrid children with
with humans that were prophets to humanity for news about their origins. Examples of these prophets were said to be Buddha, Gandhi, Muhammad, Jesus, and of course Rael himself. They also believed Earth is in the age of apocalypse and we need to harness new scientific and technological development for peaceful purposes. And that when this has been achieved, the Elohim will return to Earth and share their technology with humanity to establish a utopia. As a result, on their compound in France and then Quebec, Raelians have sought to build an embassy for the Elohim that incorporates a landing pad for their spaceships as well as gardens and temples. Rael's other interests included rampant banging, so of course he had a harem with the fun title Order of Angels. He was also super into the idea of cloning and created CloneAid, an organization that engaged in the research of human cloning, but their 2002 claim of a successful clone is highly scrutinized, as no scientific proof was found and it was also brought to the public attention, most of the staff had no education in science. Regardless, the international realism movement claims tens of thousands of members, the majority in the francophone areas of western Europe and North America and parts of East Asia. They often attract younger members due to their endorsement of LGBTA and women's rights, as well as aid in climate and nuclear protests. Also, the aliens apparently promised us alien pleasure bot, so I think some people just want to see if that's for real. My feet phobic people, it's time to tune out. Number 6 is the foot reading cult. Let's unpack this whole disaster. To start, leader Hogan Fukunaga claims to be the reincarnation of both Jesus and Buddha and can diagnose followers problems by simply examining their feet and that they would die if they were not examined appropriately. But in reality, he is a money grubbing millionaire who took advantage of the sick and fearful. New members were initiated by being forced to stay up for days and like run around the streets yelling cheesy self help book lines like I am living a happy and healthy life. After they'd have the joyous opportunity of being shoved into private rooms where they're intimidated by thugs into giving the cult more money. Hogan charged a whopping $900 per foot reading sessions and people who are conducting said foot readings are not qualified medical professionals in any way and have no idea what they're talking about. They take advantage of desperate people who come in for sessions looking for answers and end up leaving paying obscene amounts of money on sessions, ornaments, scrolls, books. There are numerous accounts of people who failed to attend all of Fukunaga's sessions and are guilt tripped, told that they would die or their illnesses were their own fault. In 1987, the group gained official recognition as a religious corporation and the businessman started raking in over 30,000 monthly from his scams. Naturally, the authorities are on his tail for tax evasion and three lawsuits of fraud, which in a one year window after turned into a thousand lawsuits of fraud, totaling in 5.4 billion yen owed. Freedomites are number five and they are a sub cult of a cult first started in Russia as an opposition to materialistic and governed society. Called the Duke Haborors, I'm not sure if I say it right. They came to Canada in 1899 fleeing persecution in Russia. Here they became the Freedomites, who insisted on three things, communal living, nudity, and anarchy. The Freedomites are a peaceful people, periodically setting fire to their shacks and then stripping naked and hurling their clothes into the flames. They became most famous for their all nude public demonstrations to show opposition to the materialistic tendencies of society, taxes, economy, money, etc. And in the 20s and 30s, they even stripped naked publicly to burn and detonate a whole slew of buildings to show their disdain for the government. They had been held accountable for 1,112 depredations and have caused 20 million in damage and taken 20 lives. In 1961, we saw the arrest of 120 Freedomites planning national sieges. The prisoners were of course sent to BC's Agassize fireproof prison, which prevent the Freedomites from doing their favorite thing, burning it down. A book titled Terror in the Name of God, a study of Duke of Boros, written by Vancouver newswoman Sima Holt, highlighted Freedomite contentions and factually debunked some of their misconceptions and put forth revealing context as being only one of many fanatical Russian religious sects. When some of the locked up Freedomites read it, they actually started to change their tunes a little. Younger Freedomites began working in the prisons, asking for other books and school teachers, and slowly shed their traditional emo attitude. Today, 14 have been paroled and Canadian officials proudly announced that the first returnees to Freedomite lands applied for government land office to buy the land. For the first time, Freedomites will be land owing, tax paying citizens. True Weight Call comes in at number 4, originally a professor in Taiwan for 9 years. After 37 years in atheist, he woke up one day, first religious revelation. A voice said to pursue religion, so he did. He studied every religious text he could find and then joined a UFO cult. Hated the leader, so he dipped and took about a dozen of the followers with him to start his own cult. He gained them fast and had to them open up satellite churches by 1996. What were their beliefs you may ask? Well, he claimed that 99% of the Buddhist temples in Taiwan were led by vampiric outside spirits. The Jesus reincarnate lived in Vancouver, the universe is 4.5 trillion years old. Our solar system was created by nuclear war, we each have three souls and that humanity has been rescued on five occasions by God descending in a flying saucer. Their whole goal was as people increase their spiritual life. 
light during the time on Earth, they would be able to escape karmatic reincarnation. This meant achieving enlightenment, the state of being that their leader Chen, also called Buddhahood. Chen pulled his followers' tails a ridiculous amount. He had them move from Taiwan to America, which only 150 of his few thousand followers could even do, live in cramped conditions, give him their money. The final escalation is when Chen told them on March 31st, 1998, at 1201 AM, God would appear before the world on a single TV channel in the USA. When this prophecy failed, he stared into the sun for a while in front of his followers and reporters and stated that no mere man could have done it for that long. He had them shake their own hands and speak out loud and claimed that that is proof of God being everywhere and in every Everyone, so technically his prophecy didn't fail and he wasn't wrong. His followers began to dwindle and eventually disbanded due to unfulfilled prophecies and visa issues, as cult member is not a valid reason to renew a tourism visa. Concerned Christians anti-cult is number 3. To explain, an anti-cult pastor preaching about cults became a cult. Ok, known as Monty, Kim Miller founded the Concerned Christians to speak against mind control perpetrated by religious extremists as well as keep Christianity apocalyptic and severe. Monty was never raised religious, in fact his first exposure was the Christian club at the university, which seemingly had him convert almost overnight. He directly enjoyed the concept that no one belonged to themselves, rather that humans were purchased at the cost of Christ's blood and thus everyone belonged to Christianity. That's not the best reason to be a convert. He was hostile to anyone he deemed sacrilegious, but usually Monty condemned easy targets like liberal churches and cults which gave him credibility as a preacher for discrediting perceived false teachings. But sometimes giving someone an audience is a bad thing, i.e. Donald Trump, his disciples failed to notice his message and personality were shifting because his charismatic delivery remained so compelling. His message was now that they were selected by God to be the only true church and that they must abide by the holy laws and spiritual regulations. He used tactics he'd learned watching cults to isolate and control his flock, cutting ties from local churches and organizations. Forced to live in group homes, they were also forced to pour all their money and resources into Monty. An absurd 100000 per family per year was expected. As his financial situation worsened, Monty took all assets from families and began the prophecy of his own death in late 1999 and that they needed to go to Jerusalem for his death, despite their aggressive anti-semitism. The group departs suddenly overnight, leaving gifts for their family behind. The families obviously alert authorities and cult members were desperately searched for. Some of these devotees were found in Israel, but the rest were never found. Leader Monty was one of those that still hasn't been located, but rumors imply he may just be hiding for tax evasion, fraud and lawsuits in Greece. The Seekers is number 2 if you live in Oak Park, Chicago. 1954, your Christmas Eve may have been interrupted by a group of carolers not singing but rather screeching at the sky. 2,000 people amassed to watch the carolers and police arrived to investigate the commotion. They found the Seekers, led by 54 year old Dorothy Martin, who egged on her followers in the promise that a spaceship would come rescue them from Earth, while those who stayed behind were doomed to perish in a cataclysmic flood. Dorothy claimed to be able to speak with these aliens, which started one day in 1953 when she was sitting home alone. She says her mind went blank, her arm went numb, and then pins and needly, and she placed a pen in her numb hand and apparently wrote messages from spirits. She learned every time she kept her mind blank, she could channel first her dead dad, then aliens. She meets Michigan State physician Charles at a new age aliens group, which has a small group of like minded adults seeking access to extraterrestrial knowledge. They believe Dorothy to be a conduit and followed her quickly, just in time for her to receive a very out of pocket message from her alien guides of a coming apocalypse and a chance to evade it in the form of a UFO landing in a nearby airbase. No such UFO arrived though and Dorothy felt like a failure, until her alien buddy told her that the rising of a sunken empire would flood much of earth and UFO round 2 was set to land later in 1954. They set out pan flips and letters trying to warn the world. Before the 24th there were two other false alarms, the seekers were grasping at straws as was Dorothy. So when they were told to go out and sing carols to call the aliens on Christmas Eve, they did. But they never came, nothing ever changed and the seekers simply went home one by one and Dorothy went to a mental institute. And in at number 1 today is the virtual reptilian cult by Sherry Schreiner. Born in a severely religious home, there's no doubt it attributes to the religion based delusions Sherry Schreiner experienced as a child and into adulthood. As even she claimed she was proclaiming God's name by the age of 2 and she was reborn by the age of 5 and by age 12 she'd read the bible cover to cover and had a fascination with the book of revelations for its strange imagery and apocalyptic predictions. She developed horrific haunting night terrors and she believed they were because Jesus was not Jesus and instead the son of Satan and Jesus that they had believed to be executed on the cross was actually Satan's son so he's wrongly worshipped. She believed her night terrors were this Satan's son. 
son, who realized what she knew and sieged her sleeping brain so she couldn't tell the good Christians of the world they fought, worshipped a false idol. Whew. She given herself a new title as King David's granddaughter as well, and she believed that she had also discovered the alien agenda and that aliens are paranormal and creating the biggest deception of all time and they aren't extraterrestrial but subterranean and live amongst us in secret underground bunkers. It's the early 2000s, so Sherry hits YouTube to tell the world her theory. Between that and her web domain, in 2004 Sherry had an online following of 2100 people who also believe that demonic alien reptiles were sent by Satan to take over the world. After lots of money grubbing and Sherry becoming rich off of snake oils, this goofy nightmare ends in tragedy when a follower of Sherry takes her own life on Sherry's advisement, and another had his significant other take his. Sherry passes away not long after herself in 2018, anticlimactic from natural causes. You can still visit her active website and YouTube channel today though. Thank you so much for watching, please like and subscribe, and if you want to see more, comment down below.